Relevant Recruiter Group, welcome back to another live interview. Today, I'm super excited to welcome Will Barfield with me. Will has 16 years of experience owning his own recruitment in, or recruitment firm, um, and he's carved out a niche for himself, and his practice uh, primarily focuses on revenue-impacting talent in software and technology companies nationwide. And he's partnered with his, with his, wife, uh, with his wife, Amy, so I'm sure we're going to get some pretty good fun stories today um, when it comes to husband and wife in the workplace. Um, but Will, thank you so much for joining me today, man. And thank you for being patient with the technical difficulties. No worries, Donnie. I was thrilled for the invite and happy to have the time in the audience. I'm looking forward to it, man. Awesome, man. Awesome. So, Will, as we get started here, just give us a little bit of background. Where are you at right now in the in the world? Uh, where are you living? And tell us a little bit about your family. So here in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, in the Raleigh-Durham market, uh, been in North Carolina my entire life, been in Raleigh-Durham my entire professional career, 22 years. And uh, we live here, you know, inside the Beltline, close to downtown and right in the heart of the action for uh, the Raleigh metro area and uh, have been working remotely living in uh, home office and on our own for the last three and a half years. So. Um, yeah, we're just, we're super happy, love North Carolina. And, you know, with regard to where we are with my, you know, tech related software revenue staffing business for mm -hmm. us to be in, you know, a, what I would say is a second tier, pretty strong startup community, uh, has been, you know, excellent placement. That's excellent. That's excellent. And I know we were talking beforehand that you, uh, got your professional career started off in a uh, little minor league baseball. But that's right. that kind of tied into the staffing and recruiting. Tell us a little bit about that journey. So, you know, when I was in college at UNC, I was convinced that I wanted to um, work in sports. And so I uh, got a job out of college working for the Carolina Mudcats, which was a double A, was a double A baseball team uh, here in the Raleigh market. And at the time, this was the summer of 99 through the summer of 04. Uh, they were a double-A affiliate for the Colorado Rockies for four years. And then for the last two years of my six years with them, they were double-A affiliates for the Marlins. As I was telling you, that 03 summer was a summer that we had uh, Miguel Cabrera. And I forgot to mention Dontrell Willis. So we had oh, both of those guys go. who were on the uh, the series team that beat the Yankees that same fall. So right. they were with us. We won a championship. And then they got even bigger rings uh, in October. Um, when Josh Beckett was the pitcher and they beat the Yanks. But um, yeah, when I was in baseball, really, I, I was selling to two different channels. One was business owners and I was selling, you know, advertising and signage and, you know, beer cups and, you know, Boy Scout nights. And then with the other channel, I was selling to human resources professionals right. because I was selling employee entertainment you know, bring your team out to the ballpark for your summer picnic or let's rent a luxury suite and celebrate something or how about season tickets. So I was selling fun to HR and had been doing that as a local outside territorial B2B kind of cold calling prospect or sales rep for six years in minor league sports before I ever made the transition into staffing. Right. And then you were talking about beforehand, and that, that must have been a fun journey being in minor league sports. And like you were talking about Dontrell Willis, you know, Miguel Cabrera, being able to see those guys, you know, close up and, and be a part of almost like their World Series run. I think you guys beat my Giants that year. I think the Marlins beat the Giants to get there. I don't know. I can't remember. Um, that was the, the – I know they beat the Cubs, and that was that really controversial thing with the dude with the glasses. You remember with the Cubs? Right. and Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was that same summer where he got in trouble for catching the ball. Catching the ball, was, right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was that. So yeah. Gosh, I, I, really I, happy with year, I know the, the Marlins eliminated the Giants one of those years. I don't know which one it was, but um, yeah. So how did you kind of tie in from your, obviously that HR experience you had from the minor league baseball team helped with how you transitioned into the recruiting industry. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the, the woman that I was dating my last two years working in baseball uh, is my wife. And I um, met her during that period of time, and she was really interested in me, but not so interested in the fact that I was at the ballpark all the time. Minor league baseball, for anybody who's worked in minor league sports before, mm -hmm. it is not a job. It's a lifestyle. Right. And you were there. You got 70 home games during the summer. You're there from 8 in the morning to midnight. I mean, it's the, the one great thing about it was it imbued in me a work ethic that was off the charts when I left sports and went into, you know, normal nine to five. 
Right. But, you know, she's, she was like, I want you to meet these people. And it was Rod and Lee Frankel, F-R-A-N-K-E-L. She said, they own a staffing agency and, you know, they maybe they can help you find a different job. So I went over and interviewed with them and long story short, over a period of time, we stayed in contact. And then when I was about ready to you know, make my transition out of baseball, they offered me to come work for them hmm. because the math made sense local outside territorial salesperson right calling on small business owners and human resources professionals and this is a local staffing agency doing temporary attempt to hire and direct placement contingent work with local small business so small business owners hr professionals the transition there was smooth it was just for me it was a very hard shift that I didn't, I didn't even conceive Donnie of how difficult it was going to be mm-hmm. to go from selling fun <laughs> to selling staffing. Because right. even when I got a no in baseball sales, it was a nice no. It was mm-hmm. like, Hey, you know what? We're doing a picnic this year at the park and, or in the parking lot, we're doing like a, you know, a pig cooking. And so maybe next year, but you know, send me some information and give me a call in the fall or something. And in staffing, when you're cold calling human resources <laughs> professionals in the staffing business, you know, I got a big smile on my face because, you know, right. my cold calls have been happy. And, and I'm like, hey, this is Will Barfield with uh, Frankel Staffing Partners. How are you? Oh, right. So for the first six months, it was really just listening to pain mm-hmm. about the things that the sales rep before me did, or these recruiters, you know, this was in 04, right? right. What well, you guys are f- group faxing me resumes, like, I, stop. Or what, you know, recruiters just show up in the office building with donuts without an appointment. And it was, I heard all, you know, you go around me to the hiring managers when I tell you we're not taking on new vendors to get requisitions. How do I know that you're going to be there in three months? Cause you guys turn over all the time. And it, so it was just, it was really tough in that first half a year to get any rhythm because I wasn't used to that kind of blowback. Uh, Cause it's not like there was that many baseball salespeople in minor league sports in my market. I didn't have a lot of competition, but I could walk out of the Frankel office building and throw a rock and hit 15 staffing agencies. So right. not only did you have a saturation issue, but you had an over pursuit issue and there was so much undoing to do from a reputation and brand standpoint that it took me a while to get my groove. Right. Right. Now I know you had success in that company, but then I know that that was kind of how you ended up finding your little Avenue, right. Yeah. Um, within that company where you found the opportunity. Um, fortunately, it sounds like you had some, some good people to work for that allowed you for a little bit of flexibility to go explore another kind of vertical within the company, but, you know, share a little bit about that. Yeah. So when, but, but when I came to work for them, they had already been in business a decade, mm-hmm. wonderful people had about a 12 to 13 person company at the time. The reason I went to work for them was when I made the choice, obviously, as I said, the math made sense, right? Right. Market I was selling to. Right. I also loved how long the employees had been there with them because they had longevity, Mm -hmm. six, seven, eight years. And they had been in business 10. Right. And it was like a family. And I had just come from a very, very small baseball team where the owner was, you know, down the hall and we were like a family too. So that felt good. Right. The, uh, the market that they served was, you know, small business and it was temporary and temp to hire and direct placement onesies, twosies. We didn't really have any huge volume clients. It was much more about higher margin and, uh, you know, a spread of a variety of businesses and administrative and customer support and accounting and finance and human resources and operations. And they had a good biotechnology and clinical and pharma practice because we have a lot of that here in research triangle park area. Uh, But that was kind of the, the mix of business that I was selling. And as I started going out in my market as a new business developer in the mid two thousands, that was, around the time where Raleigh and Durham were starting to get a little bit of pace and heat around tech, you know, with companies like Red Hat and Channel Advisor and School Dude, which became Dude Solutions and others that were starting to grow and expand. And when I was calling on, you know, I would call anybody and everybody 
because we offered so many different service lines. But when I was calling on these tech companies, um, they were not necessarily looking for admins. And we didn't even have an IT practice line. That was not a specialty that they wanted to do. And in my opinion, Donnie, if you're going to be IT, you tend to need to be all IT to do it really well. I don't right. have not found that a admin CSR accounting finance also has an IT practice that really is as good as somebody who's just laser focused in IT. So right. their philosophy was, you know, let's let the po- folks who do that do it well. Mm-hmm. But these folks that I would meet with that were like, hey, you know, it's nice to meet you. You know, sure, we'll stay in touch, but we don't need to attempt to hire a receptionist right now. Like, but do you have any salespeople? And, and you know, I, initially I said, no, you know, it's not a practice line of ours, but, you know, I, I thank you so much and, you know, hope to see you again soon. And weeks go on and months go on and these cold calls and you know, the theme of the meeting is the same. It's really around, we're trying to grow. We need sales. Right. And so one day they were like, well, you know, no, thank you on the admins. Nice to meet you. Uh, by the way, do you staff salespeople? And I said, yeah, we sure do. Let me have that job order. And so went back to the office and, you know, essentially the concern as more of this started happening from my ownership was because we don't have a dedicated sales recruiter, because we don't really have a pipeline built, are we going to be able to meet those demands? Right. Are we going to satisfy the market? Can you deliver? What they were, yeah. <laughs> what they were willing to let me do because they're the, that kind of people was experiment. Mm-hmm. And they said, okay, sure. My job is to bring in new sales for the company. My job was also to grow a sales team. So for, for 19 years, I was a local territorial cold caller. And for 16 of those 19, I was a player coach in this market. But, you know, I, they, but they said, look, let's not have your sales fall off. You got to continue to hire and train our sales staff. But if you want to work on some sales positions on occasion for the software companies, we'll pay you the salesperson's commission for finding it and the recruiter's commission for filling it because we don't have someone we can give you to support you on the recruiting side. I said, okay. I mean, that's a double win. So right. filled that first job. I, I, they let me keep and then went back to that client and they gave me a second one and filled that. And, you know, as far as I was concerned, that's proof of concept and went around town over the next several months and years telling these startups as they were popping up that, I could help with sales related hiring inside sales reps, right? You know, BDRs and SDRs and AEs and built the reputation for being the guy to go to in town for those kind of positions. And then as other startups would communicate with one another and these founders would talk and these CEOs, the network started feeding me this business. And ultimately what happened was I ended up building inside their agency and running on my own a full service sales recruiting practice that I ran from source to fill in addition to running sales and the sales team. And then, you know, you staff, you do a good job staffing for the VP of sales and then the VP of marketing is like, who's this guy, you know? And and then it's like, well, if you're filling sales jobs, you know, can you fill this marketing job? Right. And so sales became marketing, became customer success, account management, business development, sales engineering, solutions architecture, really learning everything inside that software technology company that impacts revenue and started staffing all kinds of jobs like that. Mm -hmm. And then in like 16, late 16, early 17, a lot of the company I was was working with at the time started to hit significant milestones. They either went IPO or they got acquired by private equity or they raised a huge B or C, right? And they're starting to explode. Right. And then I had a decision to make. And this is another wonderful part about these people I work for, mm-hmm. was as the only guy in town that these companies are coming to for this work, and I, already, I had built a fence around it over the last 12 years at that point. Mm-hmm. Do I stay with them and continue to try and you know, work both for them and with this burgeoning business? Or do, you know, do my wife and I go off on our own? And I met with them and talked about it. And they said, look, um, no non-compete. Wow. We, that's, we, that's, that's amazing. We, we let you try this. You were successful, which is not a surprise. You, since you've been here, you've, you've tripled our revenue. 
you, you've been amazing. You're like a, you know, it's like a son. They're right. a dozen and a half years. They said, you have our blessing. Take it. Go be successful. So I was spoiled. I took a 12-year-old business that was incubated inside another, mm -hmm. already had clients and revenue, and just dropped it out and went from making, you know, 12% commission on each fill to 100 immediately. So we were cash flow positive day one and right. scaled from there. So it was a an absolute dream scenario and a really credit to Rod and Lee Frankel for giving me a shot in the business in the first place mm -hmm. and helping me not walk away when I was so frustrated in the early days and then being willing to let me experiment at something that really put them at risk of me yeah. staying long term. But it was phenomenal. No, it's amazing. I mean, I talked to so many different people and it, it really is amazing how many people get caught into those non-competes yep. and you know, I think they're there for a reason, obviously. In certain situations, it, it, it obviously makes a lot of sense for, you know, the company owner to have those things in a place. But then there's a part of being reasonable and being a human and, and doing what's doing what's right. And I, I think there's probably few people that do what, what those people did for you in your situation. That's that's incredible. We're still incredibly close friends. We yep. get together and break bread and check in on them and their kids. And uh, they mean a lot to us. I mean, they really yep. set me up for this. And their point, Donnie, was, look. If we tried to keep the practice, we'd fail. They're your clients. It's your reputation. And they're your candidates. Like you leave, they're going to drift with you anyway. Like, why would we fight you? Just go. Mm -hmm. Go do something amazing. Yeah. And I, you know, when I launched, you know, I, I was struggling to figure out what to name the business. Um, and ultimately, so I got some great advice from a friend of mine, um, Ron Carson, who is a, a local, uh, you know, chief marketing officer, and he's owned his own consulting practice. He's a really good dude. And I said, I'm, I think I'm going to call this Revenue One, like your one source of revenue. He's like, that's awesome, and you're a moron. And I said, <laughs> Ron, that hurts. And he said, everybody in town knows you. They do business with you because of your name. If your mm -hmm. name isn't on it, it won't send the right message, he said. But if your name is on it, when it's, they'll, they won't even think that a separation has happened. I mean, it'll just be instant and it'll flop right over and off you go. And it was great advice. And we called it Barfield Revenue Consulting and off we went. And let me say something about the, the name choice too. Mm -hmm. You know just as well as I do that if I called it Barfield Sales Recruiting, I would immediately be pigeonholed. And people would decide that they know what I do before they even talk to me. Yep. Or if I called it Barfield Sales Consulting, they'd be like, oh, he's probably got some like, you know, scheme or pitch or something that he's, you know, bought the franchise rights to and he's going to try and sales consult me. But I called it Barfield Revenue Consulting because that begs a question every time. People always say, well, what does that mean? Right. So every single time I give my name, they're like, well, Barfield Revenue Consulting, what does that mean? And it's, it's I step right into a pitch. Yeah, that's 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 really good thinking in in terms of uh, good advice by that guy to, you know, attach onto your name and then yeah, not going into the recruiting. We talked a little bit about the recruiting reputation before, um, you know, so you're not going to immediately get eliminated from a conversation just because they think you're just another recruiter. Well, I lived through that. You, you yep. know, I got hung up so many hangups, uh, so many like uh, yep. I'm sorry, I picked this up. Click. So, you know. Uh, no, I, I was not going to, to fall into that trap. So tell me a little bit about um, how, you know, your wife joined in with, with you and the team and, and how that, how that goes. So um, my wife is 100% uh, the reason I am where I am. She saw things in me that I didn't. Uh, she pushed me to uh, do things that I probably wouldn't have done. Uh, she believed in me in periods of time where I didn't. Uh, she is um, an amazing partner to uh, have a family and raise children together, yep. have a marriage and then have a business together is uh, quite the challenge. <laughs> I would, and I it, would is, it is unbelievably difficult to silo and separate those things. You know, tough day with the kids, tough day with the business and not drag not drag that baggage mm -hmm. into that marriage piece, right? So 
it's not been easy, but we've been, we, when we knew we were going to do this, we, we were like, look, we're going to have to work really hard to separate and segment and not punish each other for what's happening in this silo over here. If it's a, if you and I are just not having a good marriage day, I mean, your kids shouldn't suffer because you and your wife are having a fight. Right. So same thing with separating those three. And we, you know, I have a, a executive coach that I work with that has been uh, worked with both of us, right? Mm-hmm. On on that, we we set aside uh, an hour during the day, each day, every day to sync. All right, what's going on with the family? What's going on with business? What do you need from me? What do I need from you? Every day, an hour. And then every other week, we set aside a two-hour block on Fridays for a strategic planning meeting. All right. What's going on with the business? Where have we been? Where are we going? Are we aligned? And then, you know, try that the weekend be the weekend because when you have, you live in a home, you're quarantined, Mm -hmm. you got a home office here, you know, you never leave work unless you (laughs) tell your spouse, let's go have a glass of wine outside. We're leaving work, right? Yep. Uh, So it's been actually excellent for our relationship to tackle this i'm the front man you know i like being out there you know speaking and selling and recruiting and that's my thing she right. much prefers to be behind the scenes she is absolutely the um the gear is inside the organization to keep it running from ap from payroll from uh, you know dealing with wealth manager and lawyers and accountants and the bookkeeper. And so she's the glue that, you know, enables me to be freed up every day to run my mouth uh, to um, (laughs) candidates and prospects and, you know, doing webinars and that kind of thing for the brand building. Um, So it's, it's a pretty dangerous one, two punch. We have hard days Mm -hmm. and we, but what we've been through the, the world, the nation, uh, our industry and then, you know, our small business here, what we've been through in the last seven months. I mean, I couldn't imagine being more fortunate than to go through it with her because, you know, your, your wife and your life partner and your business partner. I mean, that's, you should be able to go to war with that human being. And we, and we have, believe yeah. me. That's beautiful, man. That's a wonderful story. And thank you for sharing. It sounds like you guys have a, a phenomenal uh, relationship in all facets. And I think, you know, one of the things that you really said that sticks out to me is that you guys spend so much time being intentional with your planning, you know, that you guys have the time carved out to do some kitchen sink talks and, and you know, time carved out to do some strategic planning. And that's phenomenal for relationships, but it also just phenomenal for running a business too, and being int- intentional and strategic. And there's, I think so many people get caught up in the business of the doing of things that we don't set out that time to really actually be intuitive and think strategically and things like that. And that's really cool that you guys have kind of come up with that rhythm as a husband and wife team. It was hard. And, but, you know, to be completely transparent, I mean, we, we didn't really know what was going to happen. When we launched the business. Mm-hmm. I knew that we had a lot of momentum, right? But we launched this thing at 17. I mean, Donnie, we were on the upswing, bro. All of us were in staffing right? on you know, 17 and it just kept going like a rocket ship. And we went from me and her, the two of us, to me and her and 13 other people. And, you know, over 50 clients and over 100 searches and four time zones worth of work. And we just scaled. I mean, we're running 100 miles an hour and it's the week of March 9th. And I'm picking up new contracts and we're getting new client projects. And remember, this is direct hire only. I'm not right. a, I'm not a uh, contract shop. Right. I zero MRR. I only get paid when I win. Yep. It's amazing. So we, got a, we got an animal on fire. who's crazy. And then March 16th. Right. And we, that's stock yep. market plunges. Lock, you know, everything. Lockdown, day. Yep. lockdown, shutdowns, hiring yep. freezes, layoffs. You know, the, really the, the, the worst plate of poison you can serve the recruiting industry is shutdowns, layoffs, hiring freezes, and budget cuts. I mean, yeah. it's, it all came at once. Within two weeks, within two weeks, 
95% of our pike disappeared. And it was back to being me and her again by April 1st. Wow. Complete reset. Mm -hmm. And to face that, because we, we had everything on this business. Right. I mean, family of five. Mm -hmm. To face that together, you know, there was, we were moving so fast. There was so much happening. We weren't as diligent as we should have been about that time for each other, for calibration, for, for the business, but also for the relationship because we were, I mean, the hair's on fire, right? And you're just mm -hmm. like, look at that client revenue and look at that client revenue. And let, you know, look how fast we're growing and look at the top line. And then you're like, the plane, you're building the plane in flight. Mm -hmm. And then my plane just got smacked down to the earth. It, it, you know, I didn't crash. It just, it was over, like flight's right. over. So when we looked at the wreckage, right, and listened to the black box, the, the messaging in there was pretty clear. Uh, you weren't paying attention to each other. It was really, I was the culprit. Mm -hmm. And you didn't see what, you didn't plan well enough to prepare your business for what was coming. And probably the greatest gift that has happened out of all this was the fact that we had to, we didn't have to course correct, but we just had to start over. Mm -hmm. We're now building something that will be more efficient, more streamlined. Uh, and she and I are more in sync than we've ever been. And we're taking the advice that we heard, but we're too busy to right. activate and now putting it into place. And it's, um, it's been tremendous. And, you know, we've seen a really good recovery in, in business and revenue since mid July. That's amazing, man. And that's cool that you guys have been able to kind of, you know, pivot and react and, and, you know, use this time to, to better the business. And I know that kind of, kind of brings us into the main topic of today is like, you know, you've said, you know, now this is your second recession that you yes. have kind of gone through um, and, you know, or downturn, we'll call it. I mean, what have you, you, you've kind of found out a way to get through this, that's, that's impacted your business um, big time while also impacting others. You know, what's been your strategy? What's been your philosophy getting through this? So um, thank you for that. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little story. This, this has to do with the, the eight, nine, 10 downturn, right? That recession. Yep. So, um, you know, I, I called on and met with and broke bread with all kinds of human resources, people, um, when I was, you know, in my early days in staffing and recruiting, once I found my rhythm and, you know, the interesting thing about our business, not just the, the decision makers you sell to, but also anybody that you meet that hears that you're in recruiting is automatically going to send people to you that they, Oh, well, my brother just got laid off. Right. Can you help my brother? They don't know what we do as recruiters. They just figure, well, recruiter equals job. I'm going to refer anybody to them. So right. The, the, the story is going to be about the, the, a lesson that I learned, but it, important factors are not only who I called on, but who is referred to me and how I chose to behave. So it's 2009-ish. Uh, you know, we're in the, the teeth of it. And a friend of mine who was a human resources leader at a, a client uh, called me one day. I was uh, in between meetings and she said, hey, I got got laid off. And I said, okay, uh, how you doing? What can I do to help? Right. And she said, I don't know. I just want to let you know, I'm going to email my resume to you. If you hear about anything, you know, please keep me in mind. And at that point in time in 09 to get laid off in HR, you're, it's not easy to find another HR position at her level. Mm -hmm. And I said, I will absolutely, you know, whatever I can do to help, you know, thank you for the call. She emailed me, I emailed her back. We started a little dialogue there. I wasn't an HR recruiter. Mm -hmm. I was a sales guy who was just getting going and recruiting and placing sales reps. Like I was probably not the, the person most likely to be able to assist her, right. but I tried. I, and uh, I referred her to a couple people and made some other connections. And I was able to actually get her an interview just through uh, good luck. She didn't get that job, but you know, she, she ended up landing another one. Uh, within a couple months and she called me back and she said, Hey, I found a job. Uh, and she said, I want to tell you something. And I said, what's that? She said, 
I found out who my friends were. Because all those recruiters that brought me bagels and uh, cups and T-shirts and, you know, wanted to take me to lunch and, you know, all this stuff. She said, the only one that helped me was you. Hmm. Because everybody else said, send me your resume. I don't have any open positions, but, you know, thank you so much. And she said, I'm telling you right now, the moment that I get an opportunity to bring you in here at this new place as a vendor, you're in. Because even though you knew that you probably weren't going to be able to give me my answer, you tried. You responded, and you were there for me. And I never forgot that. And at the same time, during this period, that first recession, you know, I'm getting all kinds of referrals from my network on people who've lost their job or are unemployed or, and they're like, Hey, well, you're in recruiting. Can you help them? I'm a sales guy <laughs> right. trying to bring in business. I'm not a recruiter. I do happen to play salespeople, but you know, I'm getting, you know, folks that were school teachers and, you know, people that were, you know, an operations manager at a plant, but what I decided to do was carve some time out every day, at least um, an hour, right? Two 30 mm-hmm. minute conversations to talk to these people because they're bewildered. They are frightened they, and they are not professional job seekers. They're not in our industry. They don't understand what to do. And to get on the phone with them for 30 minutes to say, you know, talk to me about your resume, send it over here. Let me take a look at it. I'll look at it while I'm talking to you. Here's some things, you know, from all the resumes I've seen, maybe I'd suggest uh, I can refer you to somebody who does that kind of work. Let's look at your LinkedIn. Okay. Well, let's make some changes here. Oh, that's the kind of work you want to do. Well, you know what? I mean, Donnie, I've been in my area, my entire professional career. I just, I have a good network. and know a lot of people. I can almost always refer somebody to two or three other human beings to right. move them forward in that process to some degree. Mm -hmm. the gratitude at the end of that conversation from that person that you just stopped and tried to help was unbelievably rewarding, almost selfishly rewarding the feeling, Mm -hmm. but the, the benefit of not knowing who that person knows and being thoughtful about those degrees of separation beyond that initial conversation, that person that I talked to and helped might introduce me to somebody later. That's the perfect candidate that I've been looking for, for that sales job that I wouldn't have found otherwise, or that person is going to find a job at some point. And time and time again, they would hear in a meeting that the company was struggling with recruiting and who do you think got an email? Yeah. So I, when we, as we get back into this again, I had so much benefit over the last decade from the work that I gave where I paid it forward Mm -hmm. and I gave time without asking for anything. So much business benefit in the last decade, candidates, new clients. I mean, I could list 25 clients that came from the the work that I did back then Mm -hmm. that I'm I'm absolutely 100% committed. I've been doing it again, even when it was in the, the wake of the mushroom cloud over my business when I didn't even know where the rev was going to come from. Right. Early April, I'm doing this because it matters and people don't forget and it helps the brand. And I'm, you know, although I work nationally, I'm really a local guy and the brand value of paying in when we have a reputation fair or not in our industry, for saying, hey, you know what? Thanks for reaching out. I really don't have a job for you right now, but I'll hold on to your resume. You know, yeah. cool. appreciate you. You know, to to go the extra mile and to be thinking about brand and, and reputation and image uh, has been just explosively beneficial for me. I don't prospect. I don't have to prospect. Right. I used to. I did 20 years of cold calling. Mm-hmm. I don't prospect anymore. I've done enough good work and I've done enough goodwill that I'm a, a, all the work's inbound. I, mean, I get referral, even in right. the midst of this, I'm mean, getting a couple of referrals on new clients a week just because, you know, you did the right thing and, and you helped somebody for 30 minutes. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's 
amazing, you know, that you've been able to, in probably the first time around, you know, you're, you're helping, obviously I can tell from your heart, you got a good heart. You just want to help people in general, but the first time around, you probably weren't thinking of what it's going to benefit in terms of revenue this time around. You're like, Hmm, strategically I can go out and I can go do this. And I know that this is going to plant seeds and help people right now. And that ultimately is going to come full circle. And I think the biggest thing is it's like, it's long-term thinking. And I think this industry, you can get so trapped into what's happening right now. Where's my next bill? Where's my next placement? When's my revenue coming? But those long-term strategies are the ones that you get that inbound, you know, where people like you become the go-to in the market. That's, it's really a great story of how you've been able to do that. And in, and, and it's a win-win for everybody involved, really. Well, it is. I mean, you know, I cold called for, I mean, my first job in high school, I was a telemarketer. Mm-hmm. So I've been cold calling since 1992, but you know, no one likes it. Truly. <laughs> Truly. Yeah. They don't. They'll do mm-hmm. it. And some of them are good at it. And I was good at it. Mm-hmm. But if you give me a choice, like I'm, I'm probably going to choose something else. Right. So, but it, the, what I say to people all the time is if you are not concerned about the length of the sales cycle, you will win. All the work I get now is inbound and uh, the, the reputation and the, the outreach and the accolades and those things, it's, it's all because I wasn't concerned with when the payout was coming. Now, don't get me wrong. Of course, you're in you know, business. Right now, as we're in recovery mode as a nation, but as my business is really, you know, kind of still looking up, trying to dig out of the hole, mm-hmm. you know, I need rev, baby, and I need some fills. And I'm aggressive about going after the deal and getting it done, but I will throw the break and talk to people. When you and I are done today, I got two calls back to back at at four and four 30 Eastern where I'm going to jump on the phone with a couple of people that were referred to me. that just got laid off. You know, we've got people in this job market right now, Donnie, where if they are 30 years old or younger, they have not experienced a down job market. Right. They have no idea how to hunt for a job because they've been hunted. Right. Unemployment was single digits. Companies are calling them up and recruiters are all over them and they're, and they're getting in bid wars and salaries are skyrocketing. They're just used to like, Hey, if I just yeah. chill here, like I get grass greener over there, I'll get a new job tomorrow. And now they're like, what? Yeah. Well, what you know, you're, you've got both, you know, you've got it because you have the goodwill part of it, but then you're also, and this is where I think a lot of people have an opportunity to, to look at what you're doing is you can be aggressive and be hungry in sales and revenue and be focused on value and adding, you know, to the marketplace. You know, so much of what I do is showing and in, in, in helping people add value through content and just showing up. And it's the same thing is sometimes it's like all the actions happening below the surface. Yes. In terms of, you know, what people are thinking of you, what's going on. It's not like this win of like, I'm picking up the cold call and there's this perceived, but when we're building value through relationships and through content and things like that, the inbound traction comes when you don't even know when it's going to come. You know, somebody just knows you're there. And when you're, you know, when you're doing your job and showing up over and over and over again, and uh, you know, putting out goodwill to the marketplace all the time, the reward, the reward comes, you know, I mean, I've, so you've built your business off of it. We haven't talked a bunch about mine, but it's the same exact way I build my business every day. And that's it. It's, that's great to hear. Um, it's great to hear. Well, thank you. And you know, it, it's about responsiveness. Yep. Uh, that, that is quite honestly a lost art in general. Um, but in, in our business where, you know, we can get reputations for ghosting or, you know, disappearing or saying we're going to do something and then not doing it. Just the simple act of, replying to that message on LinkedIn, sending that email, or just if I tell someone, yeah, you know what, I'll get back to you on that within 24 hours and then doing it. And that's that content piece of, you know, following through doing what you say you're going to do. You know, it's just those little things right now that matter the most. And people don't forget the conversations I may have with candidates that I can't place right now, that's who knows when I'll need that inventory. Mm -hmm. But if you say, you know, no, thank you. Then, you know, you, you really can't go back to it. Right. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I can help everyone, 
but I can certainly try and have a, a, a small impact and, um, you know, to, to have a chance to talk to you about that today and, and to get the message out. It's been absolutely amazing. It's so fun. I can't believe 45 minutes have melted. Yeah, I know. I was just looking down at that too. I was like, wow, this has gone by quick. And um, yeah, man, I just think it's, it's so cool how you've done that. You know, here's kind of the question though, is how do you, it's a lot easier to do right now because you're not overwhelmed with mm -hmm. searches to work on and things like that. So how can you, or how do you, you know, kind of keep this activity going at some level when, you know, obviously you got to focus on, you know, delivering for your clients at some point in time, once you get revved back up. Great question. It's time blocking. Yep. And what I will do, what I'll do is I'll take a look at my calendar in a given week and I'll pick time slots during each day that are typically good because it's, it's not going to impact any, my, my, my morning work. It's not going to interfere with, you know, when Amy and I sync for our midday and it's not going to be too late in the day because my 10 year old is going to want daddy's help with homework. Mm -hmm. So I'll usually pick, I'll space them out, pick a half hour here and a half hour there. And then I'll, I'll, I'll lock them. And those are the times that day that I do it. And if I'm not available that day, then I'll tell the person, well, I could do it on Thursday or Friday during these times. Right. So it's about time blocking and being diligent. And, and the person who helped me with that most was Amy, my wife, because she knows that I would just give all my time away mm -hmm. because I have a really hard time saying no to someone who says, help me. But if I just lock it in the calendar and I know that's my rule, then I'll honor that rule it may mean that in really busy times and in busy prior times when we were exploding, I didn't have as much time for these, but I always did them yeah. at least a couple. I may trim it back, but I'll always lock the calendar and protect some time for that. Uh, because, you know, I, I as I said earlier, selfishly, I draw yeah. energy from it and I, I, I couldn't function without it. Yeah. No, I think there's such a good lesson in that too, with just that whole time blocking thing you just brought up right there. It doesn't matter what you're doing, if it's in this case where you're paying it forward or if it's, you know, whatever your activities are, but I think there's so much value in, in prioritizing, you know, the things that are going to happen in your business where, you know, when you're running the desk, it's easy to make, you know, the only priority is filling whatever that role is. And that's where all your time goes. Uh, and then you miss out on opportunities like this to pay it forward and to, or in my world, I'm always talking to people about, you know, carve out your time to create your content. I don't have enough time. Yeah, you do. You just have to time block it. So I think there's such a good lesson there um, with that and keeping making sure you're doing because those that's really the engine that's running the, you know, running the boat really to a degree with you being out there paying it forward all the time. Yeah. And Donnie, that's a great, I love that you, you know, talk to your folks about, you know, dedicating time to building content. You have to do that before we got into this situation with COVID and the shutdown, we were working with a marketing agency on retainer. Mm -hmm. And they were doing a brilliant job and I love them to death. I, mm -hmm. The George who owns a company has been a friend of mine for over 20 years and they were doing our content work and keeping us really relevant and current. Right. And if, if you're going to be online, you better keep your content relevant and current. And the only way to do it is to dedicate yourself to it on a regular basis and carve out the time and commit. Yep. No different between that and what you and I are talking about here with the pay it forward philosophy. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you one of the lessons that I learned as a small business owner when we were exploding was I thought busy and, and, you know, like super stuffed calendar meant success. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it didn't. It no, meant misery. Doesn't. I was getting my tail kicked and I think I'm doing all this for the family. And my wife's looking at me and saying like, you're here, but you're not here. Mm -hmm. You may think you're doing this for us, but you're a ghost. Right. You're not present. Mm -mm. So yeah. the time blocking piece has to be about time blocking for all aspects of your life, not just the content building, not just the friendly phone calls that I'm making or closing the deal. But, you know, Family. she'll say to me, she'll say to me all the time, when you're on your deathbed, are you going to be talking about how busy you were or are you going to be re re regretting the time that you didn't have with those that were important to you? So I've learned now as that right plane goes down and, and we're rebuilding to be even more diligent about all aspects of time blocking so that I don't make that mistake again of thinking, you know, busy means awesome. Yep. 
So good, man. I mean, you've dropped a lot of wisdom today and love your journey, your story, you know, um, from coming to the baseball into where you're at now and, and, you know, partnering with your wife and the journey you guys have been on and, you know, as husband and wife, but also, you know, as business owners and how you guys have, you know, morphed and continue to adjust and work together um, and, and just the whole pay it forward. I mean, it's all really inspirational stuff, man. I, I really can't thank you enough for joining me and, and sharing your knowledge today. I love what you're doing. I, this, this conduit uh, that you're providing for our industry, um, this open forum to have just a, a conversation. It, this, this wasn't an interview. I mean, this is yeah. the only thing missing was a couple of beers. Yeah. Um, well, next time. <laughs> yeah. So you don't even, well, you don't know it was in this. I'm kidding. Oh, sure. um, but <laughs> you think no, I've been drinking water the whole time? <laughs> yeah. But no, really, the pleasure was mine. Uh, I love getting the message out. And, you know, I, I, I hope that, you know, we've ended up with, you know, some listeners that really, you know, gathered something from this. And I, I hope that you, you and I continue to stay in contact. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much for uh, joining me again today. And um, yeah, thank you for the compliments. I love what I'm, you know, love being a part of this industry and stumbled into this industry. And, and um, it's been something that I've been really enjoying the last few years as I'm getting to know more people. And, and um, yeah, uh, it's, it's great coming across people like yourself. And, you know, if you could leave us with one last piece of advice, you dropped a lot of knowledge, but if you could give one tip to a, a recruiting owner out there, what would that be? You know, I, you mentioned something interesting there, how you stumbled into it, right? I did too. Uh, I did not come to this business because I thought that staffing was be my passion. I actually took the job to truth be told, because mm -hmm. I was like, well, if I don't like it, I'm meeting with hiring managers all the time. So, you know, maybe somebody will fall in love That's with me enough, and I'll yeah. get a new job. Like every, every sales pitch is an interview. But what I found, what I love so much about this industry, and I think people should, should remember this and embrace it is if you think about a sales job, right? I got this mouse and I'm going to sell you this mouse, right? And yeah, you're happy. You got the mouse. There's a one way transaction that occurs there. And the person that has the mouse is now satisfied when, but which is great in mm -hmm. our industry, I get to provide to a company that has a pain, a wonderful human being. And when the company hires that wonderful human being, they are really excited and grateful if it's a good experience and they're, they use me again and they tell somebody else about me. Yep. And that person who I helped find that job has a wonderful experience and they're grateful to me and they tell somebody else about me. It's the only selling experience out there where there's a win both ways. And you're, you, you, although it's you know, tough for us at times to walk that line where you're advocating for the client and advocating for the candidate, if you can master that and you can get that win on both sides, you, I mean, you can't do poorly in this business because the explosive benefit from both of those is amazing. There's not the mouse after I sell the mouse and I'm, it's not going to come and thank me. I've, yep. I've transacted a product, but in our business, there's so much explosive potential for goodwill and help and benefit that it will, that's why this gets in our blood. Right. And you stumble yep. into it and then you're like, I, how would I ever do anything else? Yeah. And I think it's, it's great. And I can tell how much you really genuinely have a passion to, to help people. And, um, when you can do that and then, you know, make a little bit of money from, from that effort too. I mean, what a, <laughs> what a, what a win that is. So again, Will, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Relevant Recruiter Group. Thank you for listening. I hope you guys got some uh, value out of that one today. I know Will brought a lot of, a lot of good stuff. We'll be back uh, on Wednesday for my regular training every single Wednesday at 12 Pacific. Everybody have a great weekend. See you then. Thanks, everybody.